Awesome God, which is um, in the praise book number 13. We'll sing it through twice. Or maybe three times, I don't know. Good morning, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Alan Daly, and I'm the, the pastor of the, what looks like probably part of the other half of the group here from John Knox Presbyterian Church, and you know, we're about halfway through our summer, and it's just been, it's gone so fast. Um, Sue and I just returned from a week at Chautauqua. Uh, where we had incredible weather and we got back without any drama and so that was that was a good thing and we're glad to be back here with with all of you today and and uh, but as we started off a few weeks ago uh, we've got a number of folks that uh, that join us online and we want to make sure that we also welcome them too so I will invite those of you who are able to stand and turn around and look at the uh, stained glass window in the back and say good morning and welcome And that's how we open our worship to praise God and and just lift God up for the all the reasons that we are here and so <clears throat> I just want to welcome all of you uh, to say how glad that uh, that we all are here with you and that we're able to share this time with you. And uh, I will, <clears throat> at this point, uh, invite Larry to come up. There's Larry. Uh, and lead us in our call to worship. Call to worship. Open wide the window of your spirits. Open wide the doorway to our hearts that we may receive and lift you up in praise. Come along us now, for now it is time to worship. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 115 in your hymnal. It's fairest, Lord Jesus. The words are also going to be on the screen, so please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together.
may be seated. Now Larry will come forward and read for us our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. It comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord, I host, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from the old the things to come? Let them tell us but yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. I have not told of the old and declared it. You are my witness. Is there any God before me? There is no other rock. I know not one. May God bless his reading. We're going to sing one of our favorite songs, Ancient Words. If it's new to you, it's easy to catch on. And um, Ancient Words. Ancient Words. We have come with open hearts and let those ancient words impart. I think that's something that whenever any of us gather here in this place is something we all bring to this place and in our hearts. Our scripture this morning, our gospel reading comes for us from Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, and that's the the parable of the wheat and the tares. And that's followed by one of the only times when we have an explanation uh, by Jesus of what one of the parables mean. And that'll be <clears throat> verses 36 to 43 when the disciples ask Jesus, just what does that mean, what you just told us? And Jesus then explains in very clear terms what the parable he just told them meant. 
He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, the, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. And so when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? He answered. An enemy has done this, the slaves said to him. Then, do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat among them. Let, them, let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles and to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then he left the crowds and went to the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us this parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom, and the weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of the Lord for all the people of the Lord and all God's people said, amen. amen. Mm. Wow, this is a pretty powerful, pretty powerful parable. And it becomes even more powerful when Jesus explains exactly what it means. So I guess as I started thinking about this as, as a text for today, I guess my question was, how many of you have ever planted a garden? I want to see a show of hands. Uh, yeah, I pretty much figured that was the case. How many of you have ever had to weed that garden? Probably at the same hand, maybe more hands came up there. And then lastly, how many of you have ever had the weeds come back? Uh, mm. Well, Sue and I have planted several gardens over the past several years, or perhaps I should say, Sue planted and I watched. In any case, the hardest work seemed to come in preparing a new plot and clearing the weeds that were there. And you know, Sue spent hours digging those grounds, trying to extract entire roots intact, but their survival instinct that really awed me because I couldn't believe it because it, it seemed like the roots often turned so that they were running near parallel with the ground and then all of a sudden went straight down and down into the ground again. And more often than not, they defeated us as they left behind remnants which we knew would one day rise again. The weeds never seemed to disappear and certainly anyone who has had a garden and has battled these weeds and lost the battle with the weeds, I think could relate to at least the workers as they reported to Jesus, as they reported to the landowner, what happened in that garden that was planted. And so in response to the disciples' directions and questions, Jesus goes on to explain the parable as one between good and evil. The tares became the evil people in the world, while the wheat represented the righteous. And on Judgment Day, they would be sorted according to whether they were wheat or tares, with the tares ending up in a pit. And so, in this context, you might say that this is a parable of judgment. In reflecting on this text, though, through a lens of God's love and God's promise, the promise that was made to each of us for the plans 
that were passed on through the prophet Jeremiah, where <clears throat> Jeremiah was told that I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This was the promise that God had made to Jeremiah and to all those who followed. And so when I, when I look at it through this lens, because this is what, this is what I'm hearing, and in, in Isaiah's text today, we hear that our God's the only God and our God's good. So, and I understand our God through God's love and the promise that's been made to each of us. So I can understand the text where the time then to take and, to take and separate the weeds and the wheat might not simply be about separating the good and evil people. Maybe there's some other meaning in here that we might want to try to unpack. I mean, certainly, who are we to judge which are the evil and which are the good people? Who are we to judge whether something's really wheat or really a tear? Because Jesus is quoted many times as saying God is good and only God is good. And we've heard this over and over again. So looking at the parable through those eyes, perhaps Jesus is revealing to us God's desire for us as humans God's desire for how we can live and act and hope in life. As evil, weeds, weeds are the destructive things then that we do to ourselves, to others, and to creation. The things that distance ourselves from God. Things that are associated with a lust for power, and personal fulfillment and gratification, things that separate us from God's and God's will for us, those are the things that are evil. The weeds are those things which arise out of our fears, fears of rejection, and things like self-centeredness, self-righteousness, and greed, things that can erode our trust our relationship with God, our faith, everything God has promised and wants for us. Those are the things that these, the evil gets at us. When while hope and faith bring life, fear brings with it mistrust, suspicion, resentment, a need to get even, a need to control, to conquer, to subdue, and perhaps even ultimately war and the need to win to survive. Perhaps Jesus knew his disciples had work to do, and burning the weeds would then only be an unnecessary distraction. So as we continue reading the parable, we're told that someday the weeds, our fears, will be burned away. The parable of the wheat and the weeds tells us to ignore the tenacity of those obnoxious, persistent weeds. And what we hear then is a need to wait patiently in the hope that the evil and injustice will someday be reckoned with. However, what I also hear is, despite the imperfection of today's fields, we're commanded to go on planting in the here and now, to do something right now. And those weeds, those things that could get in our way, can be taken care of later. You know, the weeds that Jesus invokes are what I'll call survivor weeds. You know, not simply harvest stray foliage, but crabgrass like entities that deprive other plants of their share of the soil and the sun. And yet, according to Jesus, destroying these predators is less important than leaving open the possibility for the wheat to grow. No potential for wheat is to be sacrificed. The gardeners are to leave them to the harvesters. In the meantime, they and we are to seek justice love kindness, and walk humbly before God. In a strange world of the parable, 
where separation is graciously postponed, it might be, it might even be possible for the weeds to become wheat. Explained that way, the parable might be, become a story of grace. Now the parable of the weeds has many facets that are applicable to yours and my life. It chronically comes as a shock when we realize that the world and the family into which we, the world we live in and the family into which we were born, and even our church family, is not entirely a trustworthy, a trustworthy place. The world has places of wonder, but also places of cruelty, oppression, and intolerance. Families can be a source of deep pain as well as great joy. Good mixes in with the bad. Where did these weeds come from? Or in the case of our 21st century me first world, where did this power hungry, self-centered, ego focused pursuit of self come from? My first thought would be, it came from the same evil source that sowed the tares in the garden. But wherever it came from, wherever it came from, my sense is that it has the same effect on God. It troubles God. So, what can we do about it? Just what do we do with those noxious weeds? How are we to confront our obnoxious fears, those ones that just won't seem to go away? Now, both this parable and many other passages in the Bible suggest the need for a time of waiting, of letting things grow and unfold. But then there's also a time to take action. It might be a time of discernment to determine just what we are being called to do. Perhaps getting rid of the evil in the world is beyond our pay grade, and that isn't where our energy needs to be spent. In any case, Jesus tells the disciples to wait to destroy the tares, the evil. So, as you continue to look at this and see what other things might be able to be unpacked from it, another understanding of Jesus' command might be found in the Ignatian thinking around the term indifference. Now, indifference for someone who practices Ignatian thinking is an understanding of the need to be free enough from our disordered lives and fears to be able to respond wholeheartedly to God's call. Hence, the command to leave the weeds alone and do the work we're called to do and choose whatever God's glory and service, <clears throat> whatever, and choose whatever leads then to God's glory and service. Responding to that call isn't always easy. I think each one of us, I know I've talked with many of you, and you you're, sometimes find yourself confused about what God might be calling you to do. Uh, it might not sound right to you. And we talk about discernment. That's where this comes in, is I suspect that we might, and listening, looking at this parable, we also might be commanded to leave the weeds alone and just do the work we're called to do. And so while our culture prizes radical individualism, self-indulgence, quick fixes, Jesus always reveals that personal self-giving, humility, is the way to a new life of community, true freedom, and joy beyond one's imagination. And this is this is where we're called to do those things that God has called us to do. When we think about it, when we think about the things that God is, is, continues to ask us to do, 
God wants us to let go of the things that we don't control, that we can't control, and just live into, live into that world and that life that will lift God up in praise and that will keep all whom we meet, every neighbor we meet, as someone that we can treat as we want to be treated. This, I believe, is where, is what Jesus was also trying to tell us and tell his disciples when he told them the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And this is the answer to that question, just what are we to do with the weeds? And that is, leave them to God. God is good and God can handle that. And God has promised to be there for us wherever we go. Let us pray. Oh, heavenly creator, holy one, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for walking this journey with us, for protecting us and for guiding us towards the end that you want, the end that gives us the ability to love kindness and walk humbly with you. Be with us, keep us focused on your will as we go through our journey and help us to be present for all you place in our path. All this we ask in your name, amen. Please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Generous God, we acknowledge our hearts are calloused as we shrug indifferently at both small kindnesses and great needs. We, with narrow hearts, are guilty of aimlessness and complacency. Enter into our smallness and grow our hearts wide with amazement that we have been blessed with your grace, bathed in your forgiveness. We pray in the name of the one who spat lukewarm water from his mouth. Amen. So last week, we started a celebration of ministries since we have people from different churches. I know some of you know each other from before, probably from Habitat or from Grease Food Shelf or from other ministries that you do. And I thought it would be fun if we all share what our ministries are and next week we will celebrate them all. Um, so if you did not receive a little index card and you don't, or you don't have something to write with, please raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring you one. Um, I actually need an index card, please. <laughs> and it looks like Ron needs one, and someone over here needs one. Kathy needs one. Um, so yeah, Rick and Jim, I'm asking you to please uh, pass, pass some cards out. Now, what is a ministry? It might be working at the food shelf. It might be habitat. Ministry might be something you do at work. Maybe, maybe your work is your ministry, or maybe you um, have to be nice to someone that's difficult to get along with, and that's a ministry. And also, you can write a ministry for someone else. For example, I visit people who don't get out, but I know that they pray. They, they pray, or they praise God constantly. That's a ministry. Um, maybe your ministry is just being a friend to one person who needs a friend. Um, so whatever your ministry is, I'm going to have our string group come up and play some hymns, and while they play hymns, you can come and put your ministry right in this ministry's box right here. Thanks. And if you are online, <laughs> um, you can write your ministry in the chat, or you can email it to me, and next week we will collect them all and, and celebrate them.
Thank you so much. And may the peace of God be with you all. So let us share with one another a sign of God's peace. All right, please join me as we pray for everyone in the world. <laughs> okay. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your church and for your people of faith throughout the world. We ask that you may help us to be the church that you want us to be. Help us to work together to heal your world. Lord, in your mercy. We ask that you be with all those who make decisions that affect others, those in our governments, for doctors, for teachers, for people in the criminal system. And we ask that you give them wisdom and discernment in following your will for people. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are sick in body or in mind, those who are disheartened in spirit. We ask you to be with those who are just suffering mentally and emotionally, and for those who are dying, those who are ill in the hospital, Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the beautiful earth that you have given to us, and we ask that you may give us the will to preserve it for future generations, Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we ask that you look on those places where there is violence, where there is war, where people are dying need needlessly because of greed or because of carelessness or for whatever reason, and we ask that you may guide us to heal, Lord, in your mercy. Now please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is, I have decided to follow Jesus. The words are on the screen or in your hymnal 576. Please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together. And as we prepare to leave this place today, let us all remember that if we've decided to follow Jesus, we are out there planting the wheat and leaving the tares to God.
Look for 